Why do you want to be beautiful? I want to look beautiful because people will listen more to someone with a beautiful face and wisdom than a person with just wisdom because pretty privilege is real. Beauty for me equals easy love and there's a form of safety according to love. You can have views that are perhaps controversial, saying or doing something in ignorance and still have a lot of people defend and love you. So in a way, you're allowed to be more human. For my future partner, I want to be irresistibly beautiful in his eyes. If I'm satisfied with the way I look, I can take pictures with friends, go to various places and do many other things without hesitation. To feel confident the moment I walk into a room. I want people to like me and I want to like myself. As someone on the autism spectrum, it's much easier to be let off for odd behavior, odd by neurotypical social standards. If you are more attractive, it helps you blend in and make other people like you more. So when I do something other people find strange, it's often played off as quirky and endearing, as opposed to weird and creepy, since I happen to be reasonably conventionally attractive. People notice you and are drawn to you, want to hear what you have to say and want to get to know you. I want to look myself in the mirror and have only love for myself, no insecurities. I want to be able to wear the outfits that I like without being conscious of whether I look okay or terrible. I want to open the camera and be like, damn, I'm gorgeous, without any filters. I want to be able to love myself when I think of me, so that if I make a mistake or don't perform well, I have something else valuable about me, so that I am seen in this world. Those were some of your replies when I asked you on Instagram. In the UK, a survey from 2019 serving teenagers from ages 13 to 19 showed that 31% of teenagers felt ashamed in relation to their body image. 40% said that images on social media had caused them to worry about body image. And 40% said that things that their friends have said have made them worry about their body image. 34% of adults said that they had felt anxious and 35% said that they had felt depressed because of their body image. Just over one in five adults, so 22% and 40% of teenagers said images on social media caused them to worry about their body image. 53% of US young adults admit that social media's portrayal of others' lives has harmed their self-esteem. 88% of young women compare themselves to images that they see online on social media with 50% saying that these images make them feel unattractive. Now this part of the video is in paid partnership with BetterHelp. Now, social media, as you're going to see, is not the only thing that is causing body image concerns. It's also things like our relationships and family and friends and what they are saying and how they speak about bodies and appearances. Like when I think of when I felt the worst about my appearance, specifically my body, it was long before social media was popularized. It was when I was in my teen years and those feelings were in fact caused by the comments made by other people to me. And it took me years of oh, growing up and my brain fully developing and also talking to people I trusted and journaling and therapy to get me to a place where I was finally okay with myself. And BetterHelp is one such platform where you can get connected with a therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. Over 4 million people have used BetterHelp to start living a healthier, happier life, and I can see why. First, it's very convenient because you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, video chat, via messaging, or whatever is comfortable and convenient for you. And you can schedule your therapy sessions at a time that's convenient for you. And you know, some people aren't very comfortable with face-to-face therapy, or maybe there aren't any good therapists in their area. And two, it's easy to get started. You can use the link in my description box or go to betterhelp.com slash Lana. Just fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs. And then in most cases, you will be matched with a therapist in 48 hours or less. And thirdly, and this one is really important, if the therapist that you're matched with doesn't feel like a right fit, which happens in therapy, it's happened to me, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost. Now, if you think that you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in my description box or go to betterhelp.com slash Lana. Clicking that link helps support my channel and it also gets you 10% off your first month so that you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. One thing that came up 
a lot when I asked you all why you wanted to be beautiful was pretty privilege. Basically, attractive people are more likely to be hired, promoted, receive higher salaries, and so on. I think of the halo effect, meaning that someone who is perceived positively in one aspect of life is assumed to possess other positive qualities as well. For instance, highly symmetrical faces are not only seen as attractive, but also positive indicators of health and personality traits such as intelligence, liveliness, self-confidence, and mental health. While being good-looking can and definitely does have its benefits in society, it can sometimes also have the opposite effect, especially for really pretty women who might be perceived as shallow and not so smart. It can also be difficult to make authentic connections because relationships might be initiated for the wrong reasons, and this can lead to a sense of isolation. Now, we can acknowledge that those struggles are not insignificant, while also acknowledging that the research overwhelmingly shows that being good-looking comes with a lot of benefits. Now, let's get into the evolution of beauty a little bit. Basically, from the perspective of evolutionary psychology, we want to be desired because being desired means survival. Women wanted tall, muscular men with symmetrical faces and high social status who could hunt and protect them and their offspring. Men wanted fertile women with nice plump skin and healthy hair who could carry their babies. This one article writes, in conclusion, we can say that even though they have different selection strategies, men and women are alike in one aspect. If all other characteristics are equal, they will prefer a more beautiful partner. Now, of course, today we know a lot more about things like fertility than we did, you know, millions of years ago, and our men no longer really need to hunt for our food. So why does it seem that these preferences remain by and large? You would think that the human brain would have caught up by now. And how does it explain how beauty standards have changed over time or have they? Some studies show that beauty is not learned and is not a cultural construct, but that it is in fact biological. One such study is where they found that babies looked longer at more attractive faces than at less attractive ones. And this suggests that beauty could be in it since babies could not have learned and internalized the standards of beauty that early in life. Now, I don't know, like there's tons of literature on evolutionary psychology. I've only read like a teeny tiny fraction of it. One such book that I read that was interesting was called Sex at Dawn, and it's been loved by many and it's also been pretty criticized. In fact, it seems like this field of evolutionary psychology overall has been quite criticized by some scientists. So are beauty standards biological, cultural, personal, universal, or is it a combination of all of those things? Looking at how our perception of beauty has changed over time might give some clarity. I found this really interesting article called Beauty Through History. It's quite long, but I want to share just some parts of it. And by the way, all the articles, studies, and stuff that I'm mentioning here I will have a link below. History shows that standards of beauty are constantly changing. Most everyone agrees that certain women, Greta Garbo, Grace Kelly, Ingrid Bergman, are truly beautiful. But what actually constitutes beauty in any given era is very complex. So in the 16th century, according to a Parisian doctor whose name I cannot pronounce, Jean Libel, the ideal for women was pale skin because tanned skin was associated with country women who had to work outdoors. Cheeks should be soft and pink and dimpled like children's. That's disturbing to say the least. And the best of all was the assets of having a double chin. Red hair was out, eyes should be big, ears small, and teeth present. Victorians thought that tiny rosebud lips were beauty's quintessential element. Fair skin, lightly rosy cheeks, obvious makeup was taboo in Victorian times. It was believed that cheeks painted with blush had to look flushed and lips had to look bitten rather than painted. By the Edwardian era, I don't know why I'm getting this accent, cosmetics experienced huge surge in popularity. 
Pale skin remained popular until the First World War, but blonde hair was no longer the ideal, so women used henna to dye their hair in copper shades. In pre-World War I times, full faces and voluptuous bodies were favorite traits that were associated with good health and beauty. Actresses like Lillian Russell fit that bill perfectly. From the 1950s, the face that became an icon of American beauty was that of Marilyn Monroe. I think the common denominator of beauty through time seems to be signs of health, youth, and wealth. Now, what role does social media play in all of this? Beauty has always been important and celebrated. The oldest evidence of the use of cosmetic products was found in Egypt dating from 4,000 years BC. I've actually even seen some say 10,000 years BC. I don't know, needless to say, a very long time. What's unique about modern times and with the rise of social media is that in one day, today, we see more faces than our ancestors did in their entire lifetime. And not just seeing beautiful faces, but seeing everything that people do, everything they buy, everything they are, their relationships, all of it. And with the popularization of how-to videos and advice videos, it can make you feel like anything you do, anything you are, anything you have is just not enough. It's the endless ways that we are told we can improve our looks, improve our relationships, our life, the way that we treat our pets, the way that we treat our kids. We can be more cultured, we can make more money. And look, some of this information is absolutely, truly valuable, but it's too much. You know, one person alone can't possibly process all the information that we're given and even less so actualize it. Now, I do think that as people, as consumers, we have a responsibility when it comes to what we choose to consume. While I also believe that it is almost impossible to be on social media and not be involuntarily exposed to things that you don't even necessarily want to see. I know that there's been so much content where I've put in that I'm not interested in seeing it, and yet TikTok and Instagram keeps pushing that type of content. And that can make you feel like you could always be working out more. You could always be taking better care of your skin. You could be traveling more, working harder, buying nicer clothes, hanging out more with your friends, learn more skills. I know that for me, it can make me identify infinite areas of improvement that I don't normally even consider. And the reason I don't consider them is because I don't actually need them. Because actually, although I have things I strive for and I believe that that is healthy, I have enough, but social media by and large communicates to me that I don't have enough and that I never will because tomorrow there will be a new trend, a new must buy magical cream, a new type of pretty. Have you heard of this thing called TikTok pretty? I have to read the Urban Dictionary definition to you. If someone is considered to be TikTok pretty or Insta model pretty, it basically means that they have surpassed the regular social beauty standards and are just indescribably pretty. People who are TikTok pretty have a clean look to them and just seem so perfect. If you get called TikTok pretty, this means you are an 11 out of 10. People who are TikTok pretty are the type to be able to just stand in front of a camera and do literally nothing but stare at the camera and get thousands of likes. And then there is also popular pretty, and there is four types of pretty. Oh no, there are seven types of pretty, but really don't most of them look the same. The body positivity movement and is it helping? Now, there have been attempts to create movements like the body positivity movement, where more people feel included and accepted, where more people, I guess, get to feel beautiful. Now, I am barely going to dip my toe into the subject simply because I haven't at all been following it closely or actively sought out accounts that create content, you know, around this community. I know that it's been quite conflicting, though, you know, some people have found um, community and have learned to love themselves by partaking 
in this movement, others have found that it has done more harm than good. Again, while my personal experience is very limited, I will say this. Personally, when I come across a post trying to encourage me to love some part of myself, I often find that it's a part of myself that didn't even really bother me in the first place because I didn't even notice it. For example, I had no idea that hip dips were a thing and I never cared about them until someone in the body positivity movement, I guess, um, said that we should love our hip dips and they didn't bother me until I was told to accept them. I personally feel like, and please feel free to disagree with this, that oftentimes, not always, oftentimes, if I need to be encouraged to love something about myself, it must mean that it's less than ideal, otherwise it wouldn't even have been mentioned in the first place. And that in turn can create an insecurity that didn't exist in the first place. Like no one would tell Jacob Elordi to learn to love his height, or Madison Beer to learn to love her nose. Now, I would love to hear from those of you who have been actively involved and influenced by the body positivity movement um, in the comment section. Ultimately, we must be aware that much of what we see online are businesses. And while I don't believe that it's inherently wrong to capitalize off of you know, the things that you create, um, like selling products or courses. As consumers, we just need to be critical and have realistic expectations, I think is the key. For example, a lot of people might benefit from the same fitness routine, the same types of cosmetic procedures, the same creams, the same hair products. And like, I love when people share their routines, when people recommend products and whatnot. I think it's super fun and it can be really inspiring. While simultaneously, I do keep in mind that buying that thing from that person isn't going to give me their skin or their body or their success or their lifestyle. I acknowledge that we have different genetics, different hormone levels, different lifestyles, I acknowledge that we have different obligations and, you know, responsibilities and therefore possibilities in one sense. And all these things play a big role. I like how when Adriana Lima said in an interview, when she was asked about her beauty secrets, she said, beauty secret, thank you mom and dad for the amazing DNA, thank you. Now, her routine and rituals and potential enhancements, I have no idea if she's had anything done, that aside, the realest answer is the one that she gave. Short and sweet, it's the genetics. Yes, you can work out. Yes, you can improve your skincare routine. You can tweak your lifestyle and you can look, feel, and be absolutely stunning. But remember that it will be you stunning. Just like I can only be Lana stunning. Not stunning like someone else. And I don't want to be stunning like someone else. I want to be stunning like me. Now, when it comes to myself, just like most people, or dare I say everyone, want to look my best and feel my best. I want to feel beautiful. I want to have nice skin, a subtle tan, a good hair day, and a good brow day. I will say though, what's really interesting is how other things outside of my physical looks alone can affect how beautiful I feel. And it's okay if this sounds cheesy, I'm a cheesy person, but I feel beautiful when I'm happily in love, when I feel loved, when I'm drinking some tea and reading a book or listening to classical music because it makes me feel elegant and soft and feminine, when I smell good, when I laugh with people I love, when I feel like I have a purpose, when I've done something that's mattered to someone else, when I'm happy, that never fails to make me feel beautiful.